Chapter one, the introduction to this book. Um, the book is linked to in the description. And this is kind of like a hermeneutic spirit and truth out of John chapter four. Um, by hermeneutic, I mean kind of like an interpretive method that I, I, I think really applies, applies to the Bible. It applies to all of life. So let's read, let's read that passage out of um, John chapter 4. And so the woman is at the well and she is talking to him. And uh, she says, so John chapter 4 verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet Yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And so I believe that this, this verse is really critical for understanding uh, the Bible. I think that this verse is really critical for understanding um, the American church. Uh, it turns it turns out most of the the action and activity in the church isn't in America anymore. Even though we have a sort of a sensibility, you know, that w- we are cultured and we are sophisticated, and and this is where the church is, and we're a Christian nation, and we're a mission sending country, and all this kind of stuff. Well. I mean, honestly, you can argue that none of that was ever actually true. But um, the the vast majority of Christians never have been American. And the vast majority of the church is not in the West anymore. It's called the Global South in um, places like Brazil and Africa. Uh, cultures that are different from ours. Assumptions and ways of looking at life that are different than ours. Um, so in the American church, and that's what I'm talking about here, because I don't, I don't have any credibility to talk about the, the kinds of assumptions that people are making elsewhere. In the American church, I argue that we have two kinds of broad camps when it comes to this question of who is the Holy Spirit. And so on the one side, we have the kind of, and this is, this is where I cut my teeth in uh, so-called charismania, the charis- charismatics and so Pentecostals and char- the charismatic denominations, people who almost sometimes the, there's an implication that they are they are more spiritual Christians or they are you know the real deal or something like that. Um, sometimes even people call the baptism of the Holy Spirit the second blessing. The, the implication is like somehow they have a corner on the market. Um, but the problem is that there's such an emphasis on experience and such a kind of a an a priori underlying assumption that if you have a spiritual experience, it must be the Holy Spirit, especially if like it makes you feel good, if it makes you laugh. If it makes you dance, like it, like if it feels good, then surely it must be the Holy Spirit. And I've even heard one guy say one time, well, if you're worshiping in the Holy Spirit, then you must be worshiping in spirit and truth because he's the spirit of truth is, is the way that his reasoning went. Um, the problem with this is there's no guardrails. There's no protections. There's I I can any I can get online, and I can say I had experience X, and therefore it must be true, and you can't say anything about it because there's no there's no framework for understanding anything. It's just it's almost like the new age. Anything can happen, and every experience is legitimate, and you know perhaps there's enough people testifying to that particular experience that it's kind of hard to to just write off. And of course, the, the, the big problem with this is uh, our enemy, right? And so there's one Holy Spirit. 
there's one spirit of truth. Now, he is the greatest spirit. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He fills all things. He created the heavens and the earth. He is very God of very God. But nonetheless, there is only one Holy Spirit. There are human spirits. There are angelic spirits. And there are demonic spirits. And um, many um, angels, holy angels, fell and um, came under the purview of Satan, who's called the chief of devils or the prince of devils, okay? And so they obey him and they follow him. His job is to separate people from God. Jesus said in John 8, 44, uh, he's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. There is no truth in him. And so this, this devil has thousands of years of experience manipulating people. And the idea that we, if we're... 30, 40, 50 years old, it's just quite the brash upstart compared to him. The idea that that we have a grip on truth and reality, when in fact he's invisible, immortal, supernatural, and has thousands of years of experience manipulating people, and we're just going to just see through it, just because. Of, of course I'm going to see through it. I have the Holy Spirit, or something like that. And so th- therefore he can't touch me, and I can do whatever I want. And then, well... Yeah. Watch out for your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And again, Paul is Jesus, or Peter, excuse me, is writing to Christians. He's not writing to the heathen, uh, right? And so he, he, he's, um, it's said by Paul, he closed himself as an angel of light. If, if the devil were running for political office, do you know that, that he would be elected? Because he's a smooth talker. He tells people what he wants to hear. He goes for the pleasure and he goes for what looks good and what sounds good. He go, he takes it at the throat. He goes for the heart of the thing. And if people heard him running for office, they would, they would fight each other to vote for him. Because he is a slick talker and he is a manipulator. And he is slick as snot. And he's a counterfeit. Okay, he's a counterfeit. And so, uh, you know, there's Paul, Paul writes to the Thessalonians about lying wonders. He makes himself look good and sound good and crowds praise him. And so the, the idea that, that he's not giving spiritual experiences and he's not trying to deceive the elect if he can, is it's quite arrogant it's quite proud and it's quite foolish it's quite foolish Uh, there are lots of people in all kinds of religions um i think it was martin luther who said if you look for god anywhere outside of christ you only find the devil there are all kinds of people who are looking for god supposedly a god of their own making but they're looking for god and they're not Christians. They don't want to be Christians. And the devil is giving them a lot of stuff, whether it's books or experiences or powers or miracles. Like he is fronting all of that. It's like the, the idea that somehow we're just automatically immune from it because I just made that up right now is deeply foolish and so we're we're blessed what's the solution to this god has god the holy spirit wrote a book and we as disciples of christ and people who are called to love the lord our god with all our mind would do well to have read the whole revelation of god's word um unfortunately charismatics just do not have the reputation of taking god's word seriously they do have a reputation of being spiritual and um having lots of experiences but again, the, like the devil's a counterfeit, and he he he'd love for you to have experiences all day long. Jesus, he'll he'll give you every experience you want to have. Jesus, he doesn't tell you how much it costs, <laughs> right? Okay, what's the other side? The other side, I'm going to call the Reform Presbyterians, but there must be many others that kind of are along this side. And the 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 claim is oh, we know who the Holy Spirit is through the biblical revelation. Those charismatics are crazy. 
<laughs> right? They'll say something like that. We know who God is based upon the biblical revelation. Except then the, the very funny thing is after the claim of stunning bib- biblicality or whatever, I don't even know if that's a word, um, stunning adherence to the Bible, then they don't, they don't do what's written in the Bible, right? And so this, this, this thing of, of truth, of we're just going to do what God has revealed in his word, and hey, do I believe in the word 100%? This book, I, de- I desired for this book to exalt the word, which is why it, about everything that I've written is footnotes. I mean, the, the exception would really be this chapter um, in the introduction. And so take for this example, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so Paul is giving an example of what it looks like to have a church meeting. And so we have all these different people. The, the Holy Spirit is filling the body of Christ. One person has a gift of tongues. Another person is interpreting it. One person has a prophecy. Another person is testing it. One person has a word of knowledge. One person has a word of wisdom. One person has a psalm. Right. And so this, this idea, instead of, you know, the, the, um, the very few leaders of the church. And again, the Bible does teach that there are pastors and elders, but the, the idea that the the church is edified by the very few and everybody else are consumers and lay people. Well, that's not, that's just not at all the picture that we get in the early church. And it's also not at all the picture that Paul gives of this church meeting in first Corinthians chapter 14. Okay. We get a picture of, of maybe 10 or 14 people, excuse me 10 or 14 people using their spiritual gifts in order to build up and strengthen and confirm and establish and edify the body of Christ and not just the guy one guy who's rambling on you know sing a song ramble on for a little while and then go home Um, there's uh, perhaps a, a low expectation of meeting God there's not a, I, not like Moses, remember Moses said, if you don't go with us, then I'm not going. There is a, we come here and we do our little ritual and then we go home. And then we kind of wonder why so many people are skeptical about the church and they're, they're not meeting God. They're going there listening to some guy ramble on for a little while in his suit and tie and then they um, leave. And it's like, can we be a people who desire, and the presence of the Holy Spirit is the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the glory of God. Can we be a people who say, if God isn't going to show up in our little meeting that we made up, then we're not leaving or we're not going. Something. Like, can we say, we have got to encounter the living God. And if we do not encounter the living God, then I ain't doing it. Or I'm going to keep on doing it until God shows up. Something, some kind of an attitude that demands that God actually shows up in the whole thing. How much of uh, the all the ceremonies that Israel did was just like this false lip service worship where we claim that we know God, but we don't, we don't do what he says or we don't live our lives according to how he told us to do it. And so this is my point. This other side claiming to know who the Holy Spirit is Claiming to be stunningly biblical, but yet they don't do what's said in the Bible. As 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the one example. And so then it's like, okay, you say you're biblical. Anybody, the devil can say that. Anybody can say that. You say you're biblical, but then you don't do it. Like, the Father is looking for those to worship him in spirit and in truth, not just both. I think that there's a fear, maybe, on the, the kind of reform side you know, okay, we don't have the Bible like right in front of us. You know, we have, we store it in our heart. We don't have it right in front of us. And so whenever we get in the real world where the rubber hits the road, we start beating the pavement and we have to make a decision. Do I go right or do I go left? And we might make a mistake. And of course, this is, this is what, this is what grace is for. We try and pray for somebody that they get healed and then they don't get healed. This is what grace is for. Grace is not for flagrant 
ongoing sin. The reason why God gives us grace is the freedom to get to know Him. The freedom to learn what it means to be filled with and walk in and live in and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The way that we follow Jesus is by following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He is the mechanism that we have been given, one of the mechanisms, spirit and truth, that we have been given to follow God. And so the idea... It's, so it's, it's interesting, like they, they say something like, they'll quote Paul writing to Timothy and say, the word of God is perfect to thoroughly furnish the man of God, something like that. They'll say, oh, wait. maybe they don't want to say this because they know that the Holy Spirit is God, but they almost want to say, well, no, we just need the Bible. We don't need the Spirit. It's kind of like what the, the attitude is. There's a fear. What might happen if we get it wrong? But then there's also this kind of attitude. No, we just need the Bible. Well, the funny thing is when you go to the Bible, the Bible says be filled with Jesus. The Bible says be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you can say, well, I just need the Bible. Well, the Bible says be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what about that? They don't, they don't seem to want to do that. They don't want to do the things that are overtly spiritual in the Bible, prophesying, praying in tongues, interpreting those tongues. They don't want to do that because what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right? I think that there's a kind of a fear there. And so we need to enter into the interpretation of these verses by recognizing, number one, we've got to be grounded in Scripture. We need to have a guardrail. We need to have a framework for understanding what God does and what God doesn't do, who God is and who God isn't. As a person, you know, you're a person. And so somebody, a friend of yours could say, oh, you're like this and you're like that and you did this and you did that. And, and you know, maybe you would not find their characterization of you flattering, or maybe you would. But if somebody came up to you and said, oh, you're from Mars. I knew it. You're the guy from Mars. And you'd just be like, 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 no. Like, I've, I've never been from Mars. I never will be from Mars. Like, no, like, that's not true. Just as it is possible to misrepresent and mischaracterize you as a person, it is possible to misrepresent and mischaracterize God as a person. We have to rely upon spirit and truth in order to worship the Father. And that means that we have to store the word of God in our hearts and understand um, what sin is. Um, the, the list, for example, in, in Galatians chapter 5 of sin and and that will give us a picture of where the devil is counterfeiting and lying and seducing and tempting us but then we also need to understand well guess what god god gives words and he works through his people and he inspires his people and he does supernatural things for and through his people and maybe that can be kind of scary but God is calling us to worship in spirit and in truth, not just in spirit and not just in truth, but spirit and truth. And that's how we need to approach this, the church in the West. And that's also how we need to approach this understanding of this question of who is the Holy Spirit.